This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. I'm Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. We have a very special guest today, someone I know. Tell us who you are and what you do. Someone I know? I am your wife. My name is Mindy Jensen. I am the long-suffering wife of Carl Jensen. I am uh, also the co-host of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. Wait, wait, wait. Long suffering? What does that mean? It means I've suffered for a long time. Wow. So <laughs> if you listen, we always put our sound checks at the end. And in this sound check, we talked about Costco. And I'm thankful. I was kind of hesitant to do this, but you suggested we get the Costco prenup package for seventy nine ninety nine. It was on sale because it's a grand opening. And I'm glad we did that. Our marriage might not last through the end of this interview. It would have to be a post nup because we've been married for 21 years. Okay. Do they have that option? I don't, geez, maybe I've been duped. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a uh, kind of an exciting episode. Now, Mindy, you've been on the show before. I have. And Keep it was one of been. the, uh, I don't know, like the first 10 episodes or something like that. And you haven't been back on and I wanted you to be back on here, but Carl was kind of dragging his feet. So thanks for agreeing to this. Well, you have my phone number, Doug. <laughs> We can just ditch Carl. Do our own show. Wow. <laughs> no, but this is uh, this is going to be a pretty cool episode, and I'll I'll do a little intro, but I'll I'll let you guys talk about it. So you were both on Ramit Sethi's show recently, and you, you recorded it, but it has not been published. But we wanted to, or I wanted to talk to you guys like fresh. So it's been pretty recent, and. I could pepper on a lot more, but I guess tell me a little bit about the experience you pitched to be on the show. So can you tell us why you did it and your approach to do that? Uh, Ramit's book, Ramit is, is known for uh, his book called I Will Teach You to Be Rich. And his whole brand is I will teach you how to live your rich life. That's something that comes up in his uh, Netflix TV show that he's got, um, his podcast, his books. It's all about living your rich life. And we have been very frugal, if you want to be nice and cheap, if you want to be more honest with our money for uh, our whole lives. Yes. Um, and we have amassed a nice little nest egg, if you believe in the 4% rule, which we do then we have more than enough. We had our phi number, we then doubled it, and then we doubled that. And we still live like we're saving for phi instead of already at phi. Um, so I had Ramit on my show and we were talking near the end of the show about like, what would your rich life look like? And I started talking about it. And then um, that was kind of an emotional experience. Fast forward about a year, he was on the uh, Mad Scientist podcast. And in that episode, Brandon was talking about how he doesn't spend money either. And I was like, wow, I totally identify with Brandon and not at all with Ramit because he's like, you spend, spend, spend. And like, we should pitch him to be on his show and, you know, share that we also have this issue spending money. Um, and we reached out there. They did the process is, is rather straightforward. You reach out and say, I would like to be on your show. You fill out a form and they, if they like what you fill out, they contact you to do like a brief video uh, interview just to, I'm sure, to see what you're like on camera. And then they go from there. Got it. Carl, any, anything to add? Yeah, I kind of wanted to be on there because as Mindy said, I don't think we have the healthiest relationship with money. We've talked about this before on the podcast, how it's hard to turn off the spending muscle or it's hard to turn off the saving muscle and turn on the spending muscle. and. Ideally, I don't think 
we should have lived like that in the first place. We should have learned how to spend and had a healthier relationship with money earlier. But we can't go back, so here we are. So I was hoping to get Ramit's advice on how we do that, how we have a healthier relationship with money. Got it. And I love, it's, it's super interesting because I think uh, entrepreneurs like Ramit, and he does a lot of things, but I think I ran across his work through some copywriting courses, some online um, marketing courses. And then, of course, he has his book. But I think entrepreneurs in the FI community often have similar values, but we're like running next to each other. We don't even realize we're there. But entrepreneurs, a lot of times, they're pretty frugal. They drive old cars so they can bootstrap and grow their business. And then each community sort of looks down upon the other because they diverge on a couple points. So I think it's really cool that a lot of us in the FI community are all like, oh, we need to actually spend some of the money. Otherwise, it's kind of a waste. You're just like piling up more and more money. So, you know, we've read Die With Zero. We were just chatting with, about that last night. So this is pretty cool. So you made it on the show. What was the experience like? I was expecting something different. And that doesn't mean that it wasn't a good experience. It just like I thought he was going to give us tips on how to start spending. And instead, he did his signature remit move where he asks really intrusive questions to make you dive deep into yourself and and look at your relationship with money and why you're doing what you're doing. And that makes for a very uncomfortable conversation. And he does not rush you. He'll be like, hey, here's a super intrusive question. And then just sit back and wait for you to respond. And on the one hand, that's awesome. I never felt like he was tapping his feet or, you know, hey, hurry up. Come on, we got to go. Let's go, go, go. He was just very calm. What did you say yesterday? It was like therapy, where the therapist is comfortable with silence and he was very comfortable with silence and he would ask uh he has a lot of intrusive questions i don't know why i thought we would be different like we we are finance i'm doing air quotes for everybody listening on on this and not watching the video we are financial experts so we should know all of this stuff right i give advice to people about how they should handle their money all the time. But the advice that I'm giving comes from a position of frugality so you can further yourself down the path to financial independence. And I don't have enough money to pay my bills. Well, then your bills need to get sh smaller. Um, so when I had, I, 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 it felt weird to be asking for help and then being counseled like I didn't know what I was doing. But he's not wrong. I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to spending the money that we have saved. Yeah. Yeah. One of the first things we talked about was this trip we had been on to Germany. And do you remember that conversation? Yes. Uh, Rabit said, tell me about that. And I think you said, well, we went on this trip and we had to pay a lot for the plane tickets. And he said something like, stop. And what it boiled down to is, why do you open up with a cost? Why don't you? Why aren't you telling me about the great experience you had over there instead of trying to justify why you spent that much money? Which was a really great question. And one of those like, wow, why do I do this? And and you know, you think think to yourself or, you know, your your life where somebody will compliment you on you, hey, those are those are great pants. Oh, thanks, I got them on sale. Or Oh, thanks. They were only 20 bucks. Or, oh, I got these at the thrift store. Or, like you always justify. I don't know if you do. I do. I always justify why I have something worth being complimented um, instead of just taking the compliment. And I even see myself like now that you bring that up. Thank you so much for bringing that up. <laughs> uh, Rockstar. Rockstar uh, highlight right there. Um, when my daughter, when I am complimenting her, she will try to deflect it. And I have been trying for years to tell her, just accept a compliment. When somebody gives you a compliment, you say, thank you. But I don't take my own advice. Right. And I, 
kind of an odd thing. When someone insults me, I take that as a compliment too. So I've like flipped it around. I take everything as a compliment. It's weird. <laughs> nice. My my wife thinks it's pretty funny. She's like, uh, I don't know if you should, you know, wear that or that's a dirty shirt. And I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so I don't know if that's helpful. Okay. So Carl, what uh, what else about the experience? Is it what you expected? It is what I think it was pretty much how I expected it to be because I had read a little bit about him and I think his background is in psychology, right? So I did anticipate a therapy session and I have listened to his podcast before too, so I know how he is. What I didn't expect was maybe how mentally taxing it would be. We were, it went for over three hours and by the end of that, I felt, uh, and I do lots of moving, lots of very strenuous work. I just put 100 tons of rocks in the yard with some help, but I did. I was carrying rocks around yesterday. By the end of that podcast, I felt like I had been run over by a steamroller. I just felt mentally exhausted. I'm like, oh, I hope this ends soon. <laughs> My brain can't take any more of this. So I was surprised by that. Um, yeah, and maybe that boils back to some of the intrusiveness that you mm -hmm. talked about. And I was also surprised by how uh, I liked his approach because he's no bullshit. If he thinks uh, you're doing something wrong, he tells you about that right away. And I've listened to his podcast too. I know how he is with everybody else, but I'm a financial expert. Yeah. He should treat me differently. And he didn't. And I wasn't really prepared for that. And yeah, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely glad we did it. We have uh, already started implementing some changes. Cool. So before we get to those couple of obs observations, so one, I think, um, you know, you've both done like hundreds of podcast episodes, so I can understand why you're, you would come in a little more confident and you're like, I'm a pro, I'm an expert. I record all the time. I'm not nervous to chat or be on camera, but then he starts asking these intrusive questions. So was it hard to let your guard down and answer those questions, knowing that whatever, hundreds of thousands of people are going to watch it to just answer truthfully and not bullshit him, which I'm sure he could see right through. Wow. Didn't think about the hundreds of thousands, Doug. Thanks. <laughs> Um, it, it wasn't hard to let my guard down. I knew that I wanted, to, like, I, I contacted him. He didn't contact me. I contacted him and I wanted to have this conversation, but, um, I didn't think about how many people would be listening until just now. So thanks. Uh, yeah. He's on Netflix and every, I mean, it's <laughs> a big deal. <laughs> Whew. Yeah. I'd like to answer that question. I was genuinely looking for help and it did help me and I hope it helps other people as well. So yeah, I, I don't feel shy about it. I okay. What, what was the original question? No, no, you got it. You okay. got it. I'm just putting your guard down and answering the questions like genuinely without holding back because of all the hundreds of thousands of people. Um, okay. So let's hear about some of the, the takeaways, but maybe before that, like what were you going in hoping to solve? If you could, you know, bullet point it out like, hey, here are the couple issues. Here are the things where I was like, I know I have a problem here. We have a problem here. What do we want to solve? The main one for me is like 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I came from, I was out of college and I had $60,000 in credit card and college debt, mostly college debt. And now we have enough money to last multiple lifetimes. And this came up in the podcast. If we were con to continue saving and not spending, we're going to die with like probably between 50 and a hundred million dollars if we get an 8% return. Uh, so back to my point a moment ago, well, why do I still think about money the same way I did when I was $60,000 in debt now that spending doesn't really, we could buy just about anything we want except for like a helicopter or a jet and we would be okay. And you probably don't even want a helicopter or a jet, right? 
You know, <laughs> I've read about some super rich people who own helicopters and they say it's an amazing thing because you can get places super fast. If you've yeah. got a big yard, you could stick it in your backyard. So We don't yeah. have a big yard. I know. We, we would have to move or, or build something on the roof. I don't think the neighbors would like it uh, or their, their dogs, the yeah. canines in the hood would probably go crazy. But <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, joking aside, I don't think a helicopter is going to happen. Yeah. Let me confirm that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Not currently. Okay. Yeah, what about you, Mindy? Did you have specific ideas about what you wanted to solve? Yeah, I thought he was going to just be like, hey, here's the steps to spending more money and, and changing your mindset that'll just make it easy for you. Uh, he did not deliver. He made me do the work. <laughs> I thought he was going to do all the work for us. Um, so yeah, it, it's, I wanted, I I want to look at money differently. And it has been a lifelong hoarding situation with money. Why would I spend it when I could save it? Why would I leave it in the bank in cash when I could put it into an investment that will get bigger? But what is the point of it getting bigger and bigger and bigger if you never do anything with it? Like he, what is that phrase? He who dies with the most still dies. So uh, we, uh, Usually I re when I'm recording, I have a computer so I can like look things up. What is the, the is it the rule of 72 where, oh. where it doubles every seven years? Is yeah. The rule of 72, uh, complicated, but it, basically your money will double every seven years given an 8% return. Given a 10% return. 10% return. Eight and a half. half. See, this is why I need the computer in front of me. Um, Math is hard. Shush. I have a computer to help me when I'm recording my show. Anyway. Uh, the if it doubles every seven and a half years, roughly, by the time we're what seventy two, our money will have doubled to thirty two million dollars. Mm -hmm. If I can't spend the money that I have now, what the hell am I going to spend thirty two million dollars? Yeah. And what is the point of not spending this money now, and then it grows till the time that I'm seventy two years old and I have thirty two million dollars that I can't spend? Why not? spend some of this now and enjoy it now. And we've got kids that are 16 and 13 and the 16 year old has two years left at home and then she's going to go away to college. And let's make memories now. We've spent a lot of time, a lot of their lifetime rehabbing houses and, you know, going on small vacations. And we used to go on vacation where I would work a half day and then join them in the afternoon. So I didn't have to burn up all my vacation time. If we've got this net worth, what do I care about vacation time? Just take unpaid time or quit your job or like whatever. So, you know, lots of, lots of things. Um, and really I was looking for that magic button and I didn't get it, but I did get some ideas. Gotcha. So before we get to the takeaways, some people are nervous about the future. They're like, I'm not sure if we have enough. We need to save a little bit more. It sounds like, Mindy, you were like, hey, why spend the money when you can save it, hoard it, and have it grow? It sounds like you're not really concerned about not having enough in the future anyway. It's more like you just like saving in this, your mindset. Is that? Can you expand on that? Did I interpret that correctly? You're not worried about running out in the future, right? I'm not worried about running out in the future. I do believe that i mean the rule of 72 is based on math and math doesn't lie even though math is hard you're right uh math doesn't lie so the four percent rule says that i will have enough for at least 30 years i'm 50 years old if i make it 30 years that'll be awesome am i gonna make it 50 more years well not in the history of my family so probably not gonna make it 50 years but if i have enough Based on the 4% rule for 30 years, I'll have enough for 50 years. Um, so I'm not concerned about the future. I think I'll have enough. I think I'll have more than enough. So if I'm not concerned about the future, why can't I spend it now? Perfect. Okay. So Ramit didn't solve the, the problem, but what takeaways do you have? Or go ahead. Yeah. I think he did solve the problem. He just went about it in a very 
deep manner, which is how you should. Like giving us superficial things to spend money on wouldn't have solved the core problem. What I got out of it is every time I think about anything in life, I'm always trying to optimize stuff. Like Doug, when I have to go to the store, I won't just go to Home Depot. I'll arrange it so I've got three other stops. I'll do it at the right time of the day where I don't have to encounter a bunch of people. And then I'll plan my route so I don't have to make left turns. So I'm very specific. And I think about that with everything with food nerd. travel. What do you say, nerd? <laughs> Can you go get the post-nuptial agreement? I think we left it in the back of the car. We could, uh, <laughs> we could read through it. Live on-air divorce. <laughs> First time. That might be pretty good for ratings, though. I don't know. How far uh, are you want to go? Continue. Yes, he optimizes everything or wants to optimize everything. He talks about optimizing. This word comes out of his mouth all the time. Hey, Carl, what did Ramit say about the O word? Yeah, the O word is banned from our house. And if you apply the same line of thinking to money, every time I see something I want, it's always, I'm always thinking about the money first. Why can't I just buy something that I want and not consider the cost? Because the cost doesn't really matter at this point. Unless we go for the helicopter, maybe. Well, what's in the post up? I guess that could be expensive for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we each get half or do I get half? No. no. Do I get alimony since you still have in common? I don't. No. no. Let me tell you, this podcast doesn't bring in money. <laughs> do you want to see me destitute? <laughs> You're, you'll be fine. So anyway, yeah, Doug, that was kind of it. Why am I always thinking about everything from the optimization standpoint, and especially when buying something, why do we always go to money first? Why is that always the first conversation we have when we're considering something? And what does that, what does that get us? It gets us a lot of extra mental bandwidth being spent on things that don't really matter. Does it matter if we paid an extra thousand dollars for a car in the long run? No. I thought you had a really great uh, point last night with the uh, the Hawaii trip that we're taking, um, you said we're probably going to spend ten thousand dollars on this Hawaii trip that we're coming up to. Now, this is not like I just casually said that. We don't just here, here's that ten thousand dollars. We don't just drop ten thousand dollars on Hawaii trips all the time because that causes us a lot of anxiety. Uh, Finance. Uh, mental anxiety, not financial anxiety. But then if we were to do that, we could take 100 of these trips and still have enough money to live, per the 4% rule, for three lifetimes. Why are we obsessing over this one $10,000 trip, not the 99 others that we're not taking and could and still would have enough money for three more lifetimes. Um, you you said a moment ago, Doug, that uh, Ramit didn't solve the problem. He did. He just didn't solve it in a nice little neat package that he was going to hand me, uh, which is what I was looking for. Uh, but he did get us to think about things in a different way. And um, I'm making small changes right now. One of the things that really bothers everybody in our whole house, not just the two of us, is the fact that it's cluttered. Part of it is cluttered because we're in the middle of a remodel. And then he also said, hey, why don't you hire somebody to do that work? And on the one hand, on the surface, that's really great advice. However, this is probably the only point that Ramit got wrong. Um, to hire somebody to do much of the work that needs to be done would actually end up taking longer at this point because we're so close, because Ramit doesn't own a house. I think he's a renter. Uh, Ramit, sorry if you actually own a house. I think you're a lifelong renter, though. Um, he's never had to do these projects, and he doesn't know the process of hiring out, I would assume. Um, I would assume that he doesn't know the process. So we had those that fire in south of us last year or a year and a half ago, and uh, it wiped out 1,100 houses. There's just not a lot of contractors available in our area right now. So uh, we did end up hiring our friend Eric to come in and help us hang doors, which boosted us down the road. But anyway, the house is cluttered. And once we get all of the tools put away, I have a uh, 
organization expert coming in to help me release the things that don't spark joy. Yeah, yeah. It's not Marie Kondo. <laughs> That's cool. And I could say, I mean, we have a new construction, so we don't have to deal with any of the stuff you're talking about. And we don't enjoy doing that kind of work anyway. Um, and we don't have kids, so it's much easier. But I could say, like, not having clutter is really, really nice. And it feels good. Yeah. And uh, I cleaned the bathroom a couple of days ago, just like, you know, you let it go and you let it go and you're in the middle of a thousand other things. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can't believe we live like this. So I cleaned it. I was like, I can breathe. I can, like, I feel happier walking into this room, walking past this room because it's not so gross anymore. And that makes me want to clean the hallway in front of it, which was also gross, which was, you know, that's where we staged a lot of tools and and stuff. And um, so that was one thing, one takeaway was hire somebody to come in and help you organize your stuff. And I have always been hampered by the cost. Why would I pay somebody $500 to come in and help me, like tell me to throw shit away? Well, because I can't do it by myself. I mean, Carl could do it for free, but he's yeah. just telling me to throw everything away and yeah. that's not efficient. I'll do it for 400. <laughs> I'll come over right right now. Deal. You could put stuff in my truck. I'll haul it away too. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Carl, how about you? What are some big takeaways? Yeah, I guess the, the big deep takeaway was to change the way I, I think about Money spending and experiences. Why does everything have to come from a money standpoint first? We should focus on happiness and really try to do the things we love and not have money be the first consideration with them. And I'm not sure there's anything more to say about it than that, except maybe I think on a higher level, the optimization thing can go way too far when you're trying to optimize every second of your life. That's a lot of mental bandwidth. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of mental overhead. I guess just this morning, we're like, well, okay, we'll, we'll go to Costco and then we have to be at Doug's at 9.45 or w whatever time so we can work till 9.30 and I'm trying to like plan every single minute and we're going to clean the house until that time and come over here. And it's uh, so I guess the main thing was not only to let the money part of it go, but let a lot of the optimization stuff in life go. We don't have to do it anymore. So it's easy for us to say like, hey, change your mindset, be okay with spending money. If it was that easy, you probably would have already done it. So what small steps, Carl? And, and I know, you know, over the last year, I've seen you like personally like say, hey, I'm taking the the direct flight instead of shopping around for, you know, maybe a cheaper connection thing where it'll cost you like half a fucking day. You know, it's a huge <laughs> waste of time. Um, and then maybe you even, maybe you even look after you book a flight, you keep looking to see if others are cheaper. So maybe you could rebook like of, another. Of course, Every, everyone does that, right? No. Or hotels, another huge waste of time to save like 10 fucking dollars. So, um, what small steps are you are you taking? And I know you've already like done some stuff, and you're uh, you got the concert coming up, and a couple other things. But what other things are you working on? Yeah, and watch out, dog. Layover is a trigger word for Mindy. That uh, <laughs> we we might have to get that post nuptial thing out of our trunk if that comes up again. But yeah, uh, I thought about this a lot when I was recording with him, and I'm trying to push myself out of my comfort zone with spending. And I had three items here. The first one that Ramit actually made me do while we were recording was to text our mutual friend, Eric, and ask him if he was available to help with the construction. It turned out he was. It was pretty weird texting Eric while Ramit's in front of me on the computer screen. But, And we've already done that part. I'm going to, if we have any more projects, I'm definitely going to engage him. But then I thought, what else could I really spend money on that would bring happiness for me? And we came up with two other ones, or I did. We asked our girls to both come up with the top 10 places they would like to go in the world. They made a list, or the younger one is still working on hers, but we're going to see where there's overlap and take them somewhere for the holiday season this year. And the other thing I did, which was something I didn't think I'd ever do, is my mother has always wanted to go on a cruise to Alaska. So I told her, 
that I would take her on a cruise along with my two sisters and their partners. So the, what does that come out to? Like nine of us are all going to go on a cruise to Alaska in June, which will be pretty cool. And I told them that I'm going to pay for the whole thing. They have to buy their own drinks if they want that, but okay, I will pay for it. And it's something that none of them could do on their own. And it's something that won't affect us financially either. Yeah. So yeah. And I found, Doug, that the interesting thing is after I pulled the trigger on these things, sometimes it gives me a little bit of anxiety spending the money. But I find that after I do it and put the credit card number in there, and same thing with the concert that you alluded to that I, I spent $10,000 on, I feel really good after I'm on the other side, after I've put in the credit card, even almost immediately after. It's kind of strange, but it, it still is a little bit uncomfortable considering the money. But we did the hard part. We spent it. That's cool. So that's what you're doing in June. You're doing the Alaska cruise. It'll be a year from this June. Oh, okay, gotcha. I was like, oh wow, that's pretty fast to to be able to book that. <laughs> that's cool. All right, um, Mindy, what about you for the small steps, or do you have tips for Carl? This is funny. Now I'm just getting. You don't have to give t- Carl advice here. <laughs> tips for Carl: Do everything your wife says. Happy wife, happy life. Uh, small steps. I am on board with the whole, you know, vacation for the family thing. Uh, the, the, I have struggled. I used to be a waitress and I have struggled with like this tipping culture that we have now. Everything, everybody's asking me for tips like all the time. And what do I care? What do I care that I gave a dollar to somebody When I like, I got a coffee and I tipped a dollar because it's 25% or whatever it is. Um, So I was during the conversation, I was mentioning that we had gone out to breakfast and it was like $99. (laughs) But it was up in Breckenridge and it was like the girls had ordered massive quantities of food. And I, I, I don't. It doesn't affect our financial situation to pay a hundred dollars for a meal. So, and you know, some people are listening. They're like, a hundred dollars? Who cares? Um, and, and I had casually mentioned that I tipped twenty five percent on that particular transaction, and he's like, "Oh, that's great! You should tip twenty five percent, you know, across the board, and or maybe even increase it to forty percent." Um, 40% I'm going to have to work up to, but I am tipping 25% now on every bill. Every time there's a, would you like to tip? Yes, 25%. And because I've lived on tips before yeah. and for every person that's giving you 25%, there's like three people that are giving you zero. Um, so it's like no big deal to me yeah, financially and it's more of a big deal to them. Um, so that's a baby step. The, ooh, that's a baby step. And the, uh, professional organizer is coming in. Um, who, there was somebody else that I was, they reached out to some professional. You can edit that part out. Hopefully it wasn't a divorce attorney. <laughs> we, we have the Costco one now. We don't have yeah, to spend big money on that. Maybe it will be. <laughs> Okay. Any any other things that come to mind for the small steps? Yeah, for me, it's just trying to intercept these thoughts. And this is something I even asked Ramit about. How do I, like whenever I think of something, the money always comes up first. How do I intercept that in my mind and knock that part down? So that's what I'm working on whenever I, if I really want something, if I think it's going to provide value and happiness, I'm going to consider that first above the cost. Yesterday. I went over to a friend's house for dinner and they said, bring a salad. And Carl said, ooh, make that one with the tomatoes and the mozzarella. And I said, okay, great. I'll go to the store and I'll get tomatoes and mozzarella. And this, is a, this isn't a baby step. This is a huge step. I walked in and they had Roma tomatoes on sale. But I wanted heirloom tomatoes, which I know are more expensive. So I walked over to the heirloom tomato section. Sometimes they have them and sometimes they have like moldy looking ones and sometimes they don't have any at all. So I walked over. They had beautiful heirloom tomatoes. 
So I just started feeling up the tomatoes to see which ones were ripe. And I grabbed the ripe ones and I didn't even look at how much they cost. Nice. And I got the big thing of basil instead of just a tiny little thing. So I could put as much basil on as I wanted. And I got two logs of sliced mozzarella, not just one, to try and like squeeze it out into just one. And I didn't look at the price. That's awesome. And which is so unlike me. And it, you brought it over here. And yes. the thing is, so it was awesome because I was like, these heirloom tomatoes are really good. So I like, I nailed it, right? It yes. was so good. Yes. Yeah. I was very happy to see those because I, I used to grow tomatoes, but I haven't since we moved from Georgia. And heirlooms were like the thing that I aim towards. So they, yeah, that was a really good salad. They that were was really perfect. delicious. The, I mean, the tomatoes could have been a little bit more ripe, but you know, the day of. It's yeah. it's kind of amazing to find even close to ripe tomatoes. I mean, you can go into the grocery store and find like pinkish tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was super good. So one thing I'm going to shift gears a little bit because um, recently I read Die With Zero and we're going to do a show on it before too long. Someone that I know, she was reading Die With Zero in her book club and she basically hated the book. I think she came up fairly poor, you know, as she was growing up. So she had a lot of issues with it, which is great to get like different opinions because most people that we talk to, they're like, wow, this is really like life changing. So a lot of, I'm quickly summarizing like a couple page of notes that she sent over. Shout out to Roxanne. But essentially it was sort of, it was, she had an issue because it was like, this book is just for like really rich, wealthy people. And it doesn't make sense. And it's kind of bad advice if you misapply it, essentially. So we're talking about, you know, you guys potentially having like tens of millions of dollars in a few years. So just as a, as an attempt to show that we're not completely tone deaf, can you, can you talk about that? I mean, you guys made a lot of sacrifices over the years, kind of an open question, but if you want to talk about that a little bit, I think now would be a good time. Yeah, if anyone, we're, I mean, we're completely self-made. I alluded to our 60000 in debt. I remember we were in the middle working on one of our houses. This was like three or four houses ago. We fixed up like seven or eight houses ourselves. My, uh, my hands hurt right now from the work I was doing yesterday. But our friends came over and they're like, ah, yeah, what have you been watching on TV? And there was like, all those zombie TV shows were, were big and all that. And they're like, oh, have you seen this one? Like The Walking Dead or whatever it was called. I'm like, man, I haven't turned on a TV in years. Like it's still in the box. We haven't unpacked it from when we moved two years ago because we were still working on the house. It Maybe this speaks to why we have an issue with letting go of the money because we worked so hard for it in the first place. But it, and I'll say another level with this and the Die with, with Zero book is some of the Great things you could do once you have wealth is give it away and help others. And we definitely have plans to do that as well. But yeah, and I, the final thing I'll say is we're very fortunate, despite what I just said, we worked hard, but how great it is it that we were born in a place that you can work hard and you can come from not a lot and make something of yourself if you're willing to not watch zombie shows for a long time. I still haven't seen any of them. but I have no interest. I wouldn't have watched it even if we weren't working on the house. Yeah, I'm so thankful we were born in a place where we can work hard and that, that we did have the opportunity to do this. So, yeah, I'm not, what would you say to Roxanne? I would say that her point is probably valid. Uh, that Wow. Can I rephrase? Can you edit that part out? Sure. I would say that her point is valid for her experiences. I'm not in a position to be able to say, well, what you're feeling isn't real or, you know, you shouldn't feel that way because that's not my experience. That's her experience and that is valid. Um, it can be difficult to read the advice that he's giving in his book when you grew up with literally nothing and you're trying to get yourself to a better place and now here's this guy telling you to give it all away or spend it all or, you know, you when you grow up with nothing, and I don't know if she has children or not, but if she has children, she's going to want them to have a better life than she did. 
And that includes leaving them some money. And I I think he his book gives the advice to instead of leaving it to them when you die, give it to them now while you're alive. The gift limit, again, I don't have my computer in front of me. The gift limit is like fifteen or seventeen thousand dollars this year. That means Doug, if I wanted to, I could give you seventeen thousand dollars. You don't pay tax on that. I don't pay tax on that. That's just a gift. And I can do that to everybody. Carl could give you $17,000 as well. We could both each give you $17,000 and then you've got $34,000 to go do something with. That also means that we could do that with our children. We can start giving them these gifts now, put it into a bank account. Just because we give it to them doesn't mean they need to know about it. And then in a few years, they've got a large amount of money tax-free that they can then go pay for college with or buy a house with or, you know, something of that nature. And that is a maybe a different way to help your child as opposed to leaving it when they when you pass. Um I think that instead of reading it as, oh, this is the only way this has to be, it's just more of a, you know, hey, did you ever consider this? Mm-hmm. I think that's how you should read all of these books. Did you ever consider this? And you can pick and choose what you take from it. You know, oh, I take this one little bit. I take this one little bit from this book. I take this one little bit from this book. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think this is why I struggle with money. I remember growing up, like my parents would never put a full tank of gas in their cars because I don't think they could afford it. They'd always put like $5 in or something like that. Fill it maybe a third of the tank. When We would go to Kmart to buy clothes and we wouldn't just outright buy them, we would put them, do you know what layaway is? Layaway, yeah, we did layaway. Yeah, yeah. You, you take it to the counter and then you come in and make a payment on your Kmart like shorts. Yeah. I call the, the Kmart ensemble, which I thought was funny. You, you come in there and make a payment on them like every week for 10 weeks and then at the end of that, you get your clothes out of the back, they go yeah. back there and get them. It's pretty weird to grow up like that and now be where we're at now where we don't have to consider any of that. Yeah, blue light special. Yes, they have the blue light yeah. that would come out of it. Thank you. They attention Kmart shoppers yeah. if you proceed. To... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a deep cut. Okay, so how is the interview different from reading a book or listening to a podcast or you know whatever watching a TV show? Because I know like you can get a lot of this information, and people are like, yeah, yeah, I get it. But it sounds like there's a real change here. That's because that attitude right there that you just said, yeah, yeah, I get it. He's not going to let that slide. Hey, Doug, tell me this really, I have a really intrusive question for you. I want an answer. And then you're like, yeah, yeah, I I know. I got to think about that. He's like, no, no, tell me. He doesn't allow you to just let it slide. If I'm reading a book, And they're like, hey, think about a time when you felt really uncomfortable. You're like, I don't want to do that. You can skip over it. Nobody's holding your feet to the fire there. He held our feet to the fire. He's like, here's a really intrusive question. I'll just wait. And if you didn't answer it correctly or the way he thought was, if he thought we were delivering fluff, he'd be like, you know, I'm going to ask you the same thing, but a little bit different way. Like, (laughs) I want the truth. Like the, uh, which you did did. several times. Yes. Let me ask us a different way. (laughs) A deep question, so we're just going to have to sit there and think about it for like 30 seconds because it's weird. It was good. Yeah, it's not a book where it's tailored to everyone. This, he was, we would say something and he'd be like, okay, shut up. That's not what I'm asking. Here is what I'm asking. So a book isn't going to do that to you. Gotcha. Yeah, and I know, I mean, we're probably all guilty of like doing exactly what you mentioned, Mindy, in the book. You're like, "Ah, I'm not going to do that exercise. I never, I almost never do them. The only time I actually do exercises like that are if I paid for like an online course, because usually they're really expensive and I'm like, I'm going to get my money's worth. And a book is really easy or a podcast. It's free. You're not going to probably do anything with it. Yeah, like very few people. Yeah. So one observation, um, I don't know if this goes for you as much, Mindy, but Carl, I know you're very, you're busy often. I think you're limited with your time. You have a lot of, you know, time constraints. Did you guys talk about that at all? No, that never came up directly. I I think it kind of goes in the optimization 
uh, category, but we didn't talk about time management specifically. Okay. And I think part of it, I mean, part of it probably, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you have a lot of like home projects going on that you will be finishing soon. Now, I've known you for a couple of years. They're always perpetually gonna, like two weeks away from what I can tell. <laughs> um, so when you finish the projects, you should have more free time, right? Yes. While you didn't talk about time management or anything, did you talk about projects and doing things that you're earning more money, optimization, blah, blah, blah. Like, do you see where I'm getting at here? Did you talk about ending those projects? Oh, uh, we didn't. He suggested that we should get help. He, he asked multiple times if I still enjoy these. And I said, no, I really don't. He's like, well, what was his quote? If it's a problem money can solve, it's not really a problem. He's just like hired out. And to Mitty's point earlier, we're not going to do that because we're at the very end of these. Right. But, um, okay. We were in the middle of, we're kind of still in the middle of a bathroom remodel, but we were like laying tile and then stopped to record the show. So uh, you lay tile down and then you wait for the, the glue to dry and then you put the grout in between the tiles. If we were to hire that out, it would take weeks to get on someone's schedule as opposed to we know how to do it. We've done it before. Sure. We can finish it up this week. So. Since like we recorded last Monday and today is Tuesday, so it's been a week and a day and we have finished the tile, grouted it, installed the toilet, installed the vanities, and now we're back using that bathroom. So in that regard, it didn't make sense to hire it out, but we have another bathroom to do. Maybe that'll make sense to hire out or maybe that'll make sense to have Eric come and help us with demolition um eric is much stronger than i am he and carl <laughs> together make a really great team I, I noticed you left out the bidet i did which leave i installed out the bidet carl finally installed the bidet it's, oh, it's yeah. glorious it's nice. glorious for him it's glory ass <laughs> and we'll do i think an upcoming sound check we'll talk more in depth about the bidet we'll probe deep so so it sounds like this was a great conversation with Ramit and you got a lot out of it. You're starting to take steps. How do you think things might have been different if you had this conversation years ago? And I won't propose a specific time frame, but let's say, whatever, some time ago, how would things be different now? Yeah, that is uh, that is a great question. Uh, I definitely would have had more help with the house, I would have hired Eric sooner. I'm not sure why I didn't do that sooner. And I'm not even sure why I didn't do it with the work we did like last week when Ramit said, I want you to text your friend right now while, while we're on the thing. Like, why didn't I do that before? It certainly isn't because somebody was suggesting that to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mitty did suggest it. We've had, we've had a lot of bad experiences with, with people we've hired, but Eric is a known entity and I know I can trust him and I know he does good work and he cares. And yeah, maybe we would have let go. And that all speaks back to this, goes back to the spending because I'm paying, while Eric is my friend, I'm paying him and I'm paying him well to do this. But I don't know, it gives me joy to pay him too. He's a friend. I'm helping him out. But bigger than that, I don't know, maybe we would have loosened the purse strings earlier. What, what do you think? I would say, let's put this in time frames. Doug's not going to give us times, but I'm going to. 10 years ago, when we had just discovered the concept of the 4% rule and financial independence and that whole thing, I think having this conversation then would have been met with, first of all, I would never would have applied back then. I would have been like, no. I mean, I didn't even read his book 10 years ago. I will teach you to be rich. Well, I know how to be rich. You save. You spend less than you earn. You invest wisely, You know, blah, blah, blah. So that didn't resonate then. Ten years ago, I would have not paid any attention to what he was saying. Five years ago, I'm not sure that I would have taken this advice either. Um, I don't think I was in a position to to really accept this idea until maybe the last couple of years when the 
bank account really started showing growth because it is hockey stick growth. You're, you know, you're saving and saving and investing and investing, and there's a little bit more and a little bit more. And then all of a sudden there's a lot. And it was just in the last couple of years that it was, oh, this is a lot. Mm -hmm. Was that based on, do you think like the amount of time and the compound interest kicked in or was it the sheer amount of money or a combo of the two? I think it was the growth in the stocks that we're investing in. Yeah, we had a couple stocks. We had two years in a row where our portfolio went up a million bucks uh, each year, which was great. Okay. And it was individual stocks like Tesla or something? Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Well, any other big takeaways or things that I didn't ask about that were super interesting that I should have asked? I thought one thing that was interesting at the end of this, I don't know if this will be in the podcast, Ramit looked at me, he's like, I think you could use therapy. I'm like, holy shit, like, <laughs> you don't even know the half of it. There's other reasons beyond money why I probably need therapy. But I thought that was pretty cool of him to say and just be like that blunt. Like, that many people will tell you something like that, right? Like, most people want to be friendly and maybe tell you a bunch of bullshit. But yeah, I, I appreciated that and I appreciated his um, honesty and blunt nature. I appreciate his blunt nature now when he's asking you super intrusive questions and then just sitting there waiting for an answer. You know, because sometimes you're, you know, somebody will ask you a question and you're like, wow, I really don't want to answer that. And you just kind of quiet or you like futz around with answers and they're like, okay, moving on. He never said that. He yeah. was like, I'll just sit here all night. Wow. So it's, in the moment, it's very uncomfortable. But afterwards, there's so much to think about. Yeah, There's so much to consider. And I can't wait to hear the, the episode. From a purely podcasting standpoint, I thought it was very interesting the way that he records just like he'll just go and probe into whatever direction he feels like. And then when he edits it down, he will during the transition, he will, you know, he'll ask a question, they answer, and then he comes in with like a voiceover. So this is what they're thinking right now. Or, hey, you should watch this on video because this man is clearly uncomfortable talking about money. You can see him sweating in the video. Go watch mm -hmm. the video. Or as I say in my book, you know, living your rich life means this and you should think about these things. Okay, let's get back to it. And that was, I thought that was very interesting um, from just a fascinated about the way podcasts work perspective. Yeah. And the one other thing I'll add about Ramit specifically is he is genuine. He was the real deal. For example, one time it, towards the end, I asked him for advice and he spent like 10 or 15 minutes. And I doubt any of this stuff will be on the podcast just because it wouldn't be relevant. It wouldn't make good fodder for his audience. But I could tell he genuinely was interested in helping me. And I appreciated that. It was nice. You always wonder, this guy's on Netflix. He's got that huge show now and all that. Is he just looking for entertainment, but he was, yeah, he is the real deal. And that's great. Cool. Absolutely. And to your point, Mindy, I was actually going to ask, like, as podcasters, did you pick up anything? Obviously, his show is different than, it's a different format and a different style. So it's not directly going to apply, but did you pick up anything that you're going to use in the future? I have a meeting with my producer to talk about just the different tips that he the different things that he does. I really like that voiceover thing to work with the transitions because I mean, he recorded three hours of us. He's not going to release three hours of us. I mean, some of it was dead air while we're sitting there like, uh, uh, I don't know. And some of it is, you know, like Carl said, we would answer and he's like, well, I don't like that answer. Let me ask you in a different way. So I think that, uh, that's a really unique way to make a nice transition. Um, he asked hard questions. And when we've done some podcast talk, there's been questions I've wanted to ask people, but I'm like, eh, I don't know. That seems kind of intrusive. But I think based on Ramit and this, I think I should have asked those. And I think I will in the future. And you can still do it and be nice about it. You don't have to be mean, but I don't know. The hard hitting questions are where the value comes from, I think, in a yeah. lot of cases. You can ask 
more probing questions in a kind way, as opposed to kind of jackass questions in a rude way. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing that I liked about uh, what he did was he was never in a rush, but at the beginning, which probably won't make it into the show either, he said, I may cut you off when you're talking. That's not, you know, I want brief responses. And if you start going off on a tangent, that might, you know, lead down a different path or whatever. So I might cut you off. I'm not being rude. And that made me feel better when he cut me off. Because I, I ramble. Clearly, as everybody is listening to this, they understand. Yeah, she does. Um, but I thought that was really nice. And that's something that I'm going to incorporate into my show as well. Hey, just so you know, if you start going down a path that we think you already answered the question, We might cut you off. We're not being rude. We're just trying to keep the show on a course. Um, And it was was nice that he did that up front. That is a great tip. It's not too often, but yeah, sometimes people will just go off on a tangent. Usually it's Carl and I, but uh, sometimes other people. Doug, I'm going to cut you off. Yeah, it's just, it's too much. (laughs) Okay, cool. Anything else you guys could think of? Let me look at my list. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I look forward to going to Hawaii in a couple of weeks and spending a lot of money. You know, I just said it wrong. I shouldn't have said it that way. Okay. I look forward <laughs> to going to Hawaii and enjoying the time with our children. Yes, and having great experiences. That's how, see, I always start with money and I should start with other shit. There's no need to start with money now. Awesome. This has been uh, really fun. Thanks, Mindy, for uh, joining us this morning. And I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, checking out the episode and I guess like see the progress. So actually, I'll ask one more question. Do you guys have any like checkpoints along the way? Are you treating this like, hey, this is a goal and we're going to evaluate this on a periodic basis? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm going to throw this back at you, Doug. I guess I haven't thought much about that, but I'm kind of curious as to how we would even go about uh, checking ourselves or assessing what we've learned or how we've changed. A big sticking point for both of us is the house being cluttered. Mm. We should have a set, giving ourselves time to get it done, but a set time to have hired a professional organizer and have you go through all the tools and clear out all of the things so that the house isn't so cluttered. It bothers you. It bothers Daphne. It bothers, probably bothers Claire. It bothers me. Bothers me. It bothers Doug. It bothers everyone. So is it reasonable to say by the end of August, we can have the house decluttered? Yes, I would say clean and in a really good state, man, about a week and a half before we go to Hawaii and decluttered by, yeah, the kids are off for a summer, but I think we could certainly grab a couple hours, at least um, a couple times a week and get it done. And I have one proposal. I know the clutter is a little different than like house cleaning or whatever, but once it's in a decent state, get like some cleaners to come in, do a deep clean. So you don't have to like fucking, you know, scrub the whatevers. Yes. That was the other professional that I'm hiring. I can't believe I forgot about that. I fucking hate cleaning. Yeah. I'm sorry for anybody who's never heard me drop an F-bomb before, but I (laughs) fucking hate cleaning. And I can't have a cleaning person come into my house right now because it's not tidy like this. She would have to spend three days moving all of our shit around before she could even get to the cleaning part. Yeah. So once we get it all decluttered, then we're having the cleaner come in. And it's not just once. She's going to come in and do a super, super deep clean, mm-hmm. which is going to be awesome. And then every two weeks, she's going to come in. Perfect. And after a few months, we're going to reevaluate, hey, do we like how clean the house is when she comes in every two weeks? Does she need to come in every week? I have the money to do it. I fucking hate cleaning. 
yeah. as evidenced by how not clean my house is. <laughs> so, like, I I feel like everybody listening is like, oh, is she a hoarder? Does she, like, live in gross? Like, we don't have pile, like, we don't have little paths around our house. We're not, like, that. We, we can't be on a TV show yet. But, like, somebody will spill something on the floor and then they'll wipe it up, but it's now a smear instead of an actual wipe. I have not gotten on my hands and knees and cleaned that floor in far yeah. too long. And Carl, you just got to wipe it all up. I know that's you that's spilling stuff and doing I that. I didn't name him by name, <laughs> Doug. I'm a slob. It's funny you mentioned that we were in the Costco today and they had a croissant sample and it was very flaky. So I bit into it and like flakes went everywhere. It was like <laughs> an explosion and some lady... There was a lot of Costco employees there for the grand opening. Came by with a little sweeper thing and was sweeping out all my crumbs like right behind me. I'm like, wow. Oh, I need one of those at home, right? I know, yeah. right? Yeah, just follow me around all the time. And Sweep up the mess that will well, obviously be, you know, the wake behind you. Yeah, pig pen. Cool. All right. Well, we'll check in at the end of August. So now you're committed. We're publishing it. I tricked you guys and then you gave the <laughs> deadline. So we'll check back in. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks Thank you. Doug. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast, and I'm Doug Cunnington, the balder host, and Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person. So the virtual kind is pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using. And that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week. You guys wow. just went to the <laughs> <laughs> You guys just went to the grand opening of Costco. How was it over there? It was great. Are we recording? We are. Oh. Sound check. Yeah. We'll play we played this at the end. Oh, okay. I just I didn't see the the countdowns on the numbers up there. I wanted to make sure you're recording. I don't know if you've ever done this before, Doug, <laughs> but you record a whole show and then you're like, ooh, that was a great practice. Now let's hit record. <laughs> And look at you, you're getting off topic already. Oh my God, have you met me? I am always off topic. Back, Costco, Costco. Back to uh, the the topic at hand. We went to the Costco grand opening on May 4th. Doug, may the 4th be with you. Oh yeah. Uh, Star Trek reference for all of you nerds out there. Wait, Star Trek? <laughs> oh, we're going to like blow up the internet. Wow, yeah. yeah. For yeah the you, angry folks out there. I love doing that. I say to quote... <laughs> To quote Dr. Spock, may the fourth, or to, to quote uh, Mr. Spock, may the fourth be with you. And people email me, that's not Mr. Pretty Spock. Soon. That's from Star Wars. I like you call him a doctor too. Well, there's, so there's Dr. Spock, the, the baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, baby Razor, baby doctor. I don't know. You have a lot of energy. You got, you're off topic again. Did you put amphetamines in your <laughs> Fruit Loops or something? Or what happened? Yeah, what's going on? What are in the samples at Costco? Bringing it back. Stimulants, yeah. bringing it obviously. Back. Bring, stimulants, for sure. Also, I had my coffee this morning, so I am, like like we talked about, I am rare to go in the morning. Um, I would I would like to thank both Doug and Carl for A, having me back, and B, paying my appearance fee of $17,000. And we're here's, off topic again. Here's that. Hundreds. Here's that fifties. Well, well, dog. I'll tell you, my favorite sample were the the pralines. Is that a Georgia thing, like pecans with sugar on top? It's definitely a yeah. southern thing. Yeah, pecans they, are yeah, they're Georgia. So yeah. good. I love pecans, and then they had frozen chocolate covered raspberries, which I got for you because yeah. I don't like raspberries. I appreciate that. Oh wow, I thought you were just being nice, and I was being nice. <laughs>
And then they I had, love you and stuff. They had some kind of beef. What beef was that? Oh, it was a steak. It's on sale. We should talk about that. Okay. Exciting. All right. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I may go over there. You said it was like super crowded. So I'm going to wait for the crowds to die down. I may just walk by. I don't know if I'll go in. Maybe I'll just check it out. I usually, I'm not big on the samples. It's usually like rather unhealthy stuff. And uh, it's just too easy to go crazy in there. But most people get a lot of samples, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole reason you go. Yeah. Yeah. No, no need for breakfast or lunch today. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I could just walk over there each day, get some samples, and then I don't have to eat. Do get home. Free gym, free food. You're not going to pay for anything. You could probably live there, like just find a mattress and camp out there at night. Yeah. Hang out. Doug's life hacks live for free by living <laughs> near Costco so you can walk there and then have samples for, for lunch every day. You stay healthy that way. Yeah. Well, I didn't say you stay healthy. I said you live for free. <laughs> Well, my gym's over there, so I'm like, I go over there, work out, get some snacks on the way home. I thought Carl was just talking, get a free workout by walking. No, no, my gym's like legitimately over there. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. it's free as well. What's the gym? It is uh, the old apartment complex that I used to live at. Nice, okay. Yeah, so nobody tell tell on me. (laughs) 